Hello, gentlemen. Mr. McGinnis here. Uh, this is Alcaraz's 36 on Chapter 15. Uh, in this video, we will be discussing cardinal and ordinal numbers. Yes, there are two different types of numbers, and we'll be talking about different constructions that use those numbers. So where should we start? First of all, the thing that bothers people the most is that there are different kinds of numbers. Well, yeah, right? There are different kinds of numbers, and it shouldn't be that big a deal. It's just something that we know and are now giving a name to, right? The actual concept of it isn't that different. So the names are cardinal and ordinal numbers, okay? Cardinal numbers and ordinal numbers. The cardinal numbers are simple. They're the counting numbers, right? Your standard one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth, okay? Your standard counting numbers, whereas the ordinal, right? And you can even just hear it. It comes from a Latin word, but in English, you can just hear order, right? And that is first, second, third, right? It makes you think of the Olympics. So first, second, and third, as opposed to one, two, and three. Again, cardinal numbers, the counting numbers, one, two, three, and so on. Ordinal numbers, the ranking numbers, or the ordering numbers, first, second, third. So let's talk about cardinal numbers first. Almost all of the cardinal numbers are indeclinable, and I'll get into what that means later um, in a different slide. As you look at this chart here, incredibly important chart, and I would suggest you write it down. Uh, you see Arabic numerals, right? These are the numbers that we use every day. Uh, they're referred to as Arabic numerals. Then you see the Latin word. Then you see the Roman numerals, right? You guys should be roughly uh, used to the Roman numeral system, right? The counting system using ones, fives, tens, and so on down the line. <coughs> the Super Bowl, until this year, uh, always did Roman numerals, right? And then the ad wizards at the NFL decided that the Roman numeral L, because this year is Super Bowl 50, uh, decided that wasn't good looking enough, uh, and so they went to the numbers. To their credit, the logo actually looks pretty good, that's 50. So you see your Latin words here, unus una uno, that one declines, right, looks like an adjective. Duo, duai, duo, it declines. Tres, tres, tria, it de declines. Then you start getting into the indeclinable numbers, right, starting at the number four. So quatuor is four, quinque is five, sex is six. Septem is 7, Octo is 8, Novem is 9, Decem is 10. Then you start adding them together, right, just like Roman numerals. So 1 is Unus, 10 is Decem, Un Decem, that's 11, right? Duo, Decem, Duo Decem, 12. Tre, Decem, Tre Decem, Quator, Decem, Quator Decem, Quin, Decem, Se, Decem. Then you start, once you get to 17, start counting backwards from 20. Right, 20 is Waginti, so 19 is un de Waginti. Literally un from one, de meaning from or down from Waginti. Right, un de Waginti is one down from 20. Duo de Waginti, same idea, right? Just switch one to two, two down from 20. And septen decum, uh, well, that one is still seven plus 10. So there are your numbers, right? Start getting used to those. Just for fun, right, you can compare these numbers to their modern language equivalents, and we've seen things like this before, right, where the Romance languages have such great um, cognates and such great derivatives from uh, the original Latin. So here you see the numbers in Latin from 1 to 20 in their French and Spanish counterparts. Many of you probably know the Spanish ones, uh, if not at least some of the French ones. And if you're interested, on page 130 in your textbook, you can find even more of these comparisons, right? You can find Italian. Portuguese, Romanian, uh, and you can see how close they really are. We also see a lot of these in our words, right, our months, September, October, November, December, 7, 8, 9, and 10, uh, for reasons that your teachers can explain to you. That brings us to ordinal numbers. Now, ordinal numbers, whereas the cardinal numbers don't decline, ordinal numbers all decline, but they decline super easily, right? They decline using one slash two endings. Uh, Pretty straightforward chart here. I listed for you again the cardinal numbers. Right again, remember cardinal numbering, cardinal are counting, ordinal ordering. Right, if you want to help remember that, uh, and then your Roman numerals as well. So unus una unum duo duai duo tres tres tria. Those are your cardinals. You get into the ordinals here. Right, primus prima primum, and they're all one slash two. Right, no exceptions. Super easy. Primus prima primum secundus secunda secundum tertius a um quartus. Aum, quintus aum, sextus aum, septimus aum, 
octavos a um, nonus a um, decimus a um, and then again, same idea, right? Start adding them together. Un decimus a um, duo decimus a um. Okay, and the book stresses that you should only really know first through twelfth. So that's what we have here: first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth. Right? Cardinal numbers count. Ordinal numbers order or rank. So you see them combined in the chart there. Fun stuff. Not hard. Notes about declension. Now again, all of the ordinals are one slash two adjectives, aka super easy thing that you've known forever. Almost all of the cardinals are indeclinable. Okay, almost all of the cardinals are indeclinable. Starting at the number four. So once you hit quator, they're indeclinable. You don't need to worry about them. But the other ones that we do have to worry about, the number one declines, and obviously as the number one, it's singular only. Right? If you made the number one plural, it's not number one anymore. It would be at the very least number two, if not anything further than that. So here you see the number one declined, unos, una, unum. It follows the same declension as the demonstratives, where you have an I, U, S in the genitive, and you have an I in the dative. In my life, I've always called that the pronoun declension. Right? An I, U, S in the genitive and an I in the dative. Other than that, it looks like a pretty standard one slash two with no plural. So unos, una, unum, unius, 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 uni, 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 unum, unam, unum, uno, una, uno. Hey, like the card game. The number two. Number two declines plural only, right? Because if the number two was singular, you can't have two of a singular thing by the very nature of the number two, and that goes down the line, right? When we start talking about other numbers that decline. The number two declines a bit odd. Uh, there's some weirdness to it. So duo, duai, duo, duorum, duarum, duorum, duobus, duabus, duobus, duos, duas, duai, duobus, duabus, duobus. Okay? It's a little weird. Right? But nothing you can't get used to. And, and one of the nice things about it is that, yeah, it's hard if you have to decline it. But if you see it in the sentence, you're going to know what to do with it. It's sort of this weird combination of one slash two and third declension endings. Um, but you'll be okay. I believe in you. The last one is three. The number three declines. Uh, and the number three uses third declension endings. So again, it's plural only. Uh, and then it uses standard third declension adjective endings. Tres, tres, tria, trium, trium, trium. Trebus, 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 tres, tres, tria, trebus, trebus, trebus. Same as all third adjectives, as you'll see very soon in the next video. Um, I, U, M in the genitive, just like those I stem nouns. Uh, and then I, A in the neuter, nominative, and accusative plural. So I would make sure all this stuff is in your notebook, right? Make sure that you have these notes taken down. Make sure you know how to decline one, two, and three. And after one, two, and three, the numbers, the cardinal numbers, do not decline. I'm not going to decline an ordinal for you because they're one slash two adjectives, right? If you can't do that right now, you've got bigger fish to fry uh, than watching this video. You should go back to when you learned those. Now, new constructions. Yay! Everyone loves new constructions. You got new forms, you got to use them in something. Right? And so what we're going to use them in are these new constructions. First, most importantly of the bunch, the partitive genitive, which is also called the genitive of the whole. Now, I copied word for word the description that the book gives you, which is verbose. There's a lot going on here. It's a little confusing. The genitive of a word indicating the whole of some thing or group is used after a word designating a part of that whole. Right? Now, that's an absurd definition. The easiest way to think about it is it's a piece of the pie. Right? You're getting one small piece of the much larger pie. You don't get to eat the whole thing. Right? You get one piece of the greater pie. Now, we know that the genitive translates of. We know that usually the genitive is possession. Right? Possession is the most common genitive. But the pie does not possess one small piece of it. Right? This is why it's called the genitive of the whole. You have a piece, a part, a portion of something. That piece, part, or portion can be any case, any construction. And then what represents the whole is always the genitive, a piece of the pie. Or as your examples show here, pars urbis, a part of the city. Now, this comes up in the numbers chapter because you can also do this with ordinal numbers. The secundus maorum librorum, the second of my children. I got a whole bunch of children, right? but I'm just talking about the second of it. The city is huge. We're just talking about one part of it. Right? One small piece of a much bigger whole. The whole is always genitive. 
the smaller piece part portion, that can be anything. Okay, now that's the part of the agenda. Keep in mind that idea of the whole, right? Where something, we take some small part or portion of a greater whole. Because it comes up again right now. The ablative with cardinal numerals. So remember, cardinal numbers, these are our counting numbers. With cardinal numbers, and sometimes the adjective pauci, which means a few, that same partitive idea, a smaller part of a greater whole, that same idea is expressed using de or ex, prepositions that you know, only now we're going to translate them of, which for you guys that take Spanish is nice, right? Because you always think that de means of anyway. So with cardinal numbers and sometimes pauci, the partitive idea is expressed using de or ex, translated of, uh, and then an ablative noun, right? So it's the same idea as the partitive genitive, right? And some, our old textbook, for instance, called it the partitive ablative. Um, so you see tres ex amicis meis, three of my friends, or pauci de amicis meis, a few of my friends. Not all of my friends, right? It's a smaller portion of the larger group, as though I have more than three friends. I don't, right? That's a bold-faced lie. Um, but anywho, both of these constructions, partitive constructions in idea. Right, so again, make sure they're down in your notebook, but the part of genitive, small part of a greater whole, as the genitive always is, and then ablative with cardinal numerals, you use a prepositional phrase. One more slash two more. Uh, ablative of time. Specifically, it breaks down into two different constructions, time when or time within which. The Romans indicated that time and action occurred by using the ablative case without a preposition. In translation, supply the English preposition at, in, or on, if it's time when, or within, depending on the context. Okay, now in terms of identifying this construction, it's going to be pretty easy. The noun has to be a unit of time. So a couple of examples here, the noun tempus temporis means time. That's a unit of time. So you see eo tempora at that time. You can also say in that time, on that time. Diez, diei, a fifth declension masculine noun that means day. Eodem, die, on the same day, in the same day, at the same day. You can even say within the same day. Ora, ori, a feminine noun of the first declension meaning hour. Right? Paukis, oris, within a few hours. Now, the question that always comes up here, this is a super easy construction. You're going to see a time word, it's going to be ablative, and you're just going to know what to do with it because it's intuitive. The question is, how do you know whether it's time when or time within which? Well, that's all dictated by context. Right? The easiest way to think about it is time when is like taking a picture of something. Right? It's a moment in time. Time within which is more like a movie. Right? So when you have a movie, there's a span of like an hour and a half to two hours, however long your movie is, um, and something, things happen within that span. That's time within which, and again, that's opposed to the snapshot. Right? It's like the difference between Instagram, which you just put pictures up, and Vine, which is always videos, right? or whatever it is you kids use these days on the old interweb. So both of these constructions are very, very similar, very closely related to each other, um, and so intuitive that I wouldn't spend a lot of your time and energy worrying about them. Right? You're always going to be able to figure it out because you have an ablative time word, uh, and then the translation comes based on context. So that's it. Right? That's a pretty easy one. Um, you want to make sure that you memorize those numbers. I think the cardinal numbers 1 through 20, uh, ordinal numbers 1st through 12th. Uh, and then after that, you have three new constructions. Partitive genitive, or the genitive of the whole. The ablative using cardinal numerals, which is a prepositional construction uh, and is very partitive in nature. And then the ablative of time, right? time when slash time within which. Okay. Uh, fill out the Google form. Uh, and hopefully I will see you again very soon.